Unsurprisingly, there are numerous Easter eggs and references to other Star Wars stories peppered throughout The Mandalorian's eighth episode titled Redemption. And I'm here today to share with you the most interesting ones the chapter has to offer with 10 tiny details you may have missed in the season finale of The Mandalorian. promised to support the Death Watch forces so we could overthrow the Duchess Satine and her weak, peace-loving government. In this episode, we finally got to see the uncut flashback of the Mandalorian's tragic childhood. After his home was destroyed and his parents killed by the battle droids, our lead character is rescued by a battalion of Mandalorian warriors. Warriors bearing the sigil of the Shriek Hawk, the very signet of Clan Vizsla and the Mandalorian extremist group Death Watch. During the Clone Wars, Death Watch wanted to restore Mandalore back to its warrior ways and dethrone the pacifists currently in power. Does the presence of this symbol mean that the Mandalorian Covert is a Death Watch remnant? Was our hero raised by the zealous freedom fighters? This may also explain the character voiced by Jon Favreau, Paz Vizsla, the only other Mandalorian named in the Covert. Paz Vizsla may very well be related to Pre Vizsla, the leader of Death Watch, as seen in Star Wars The Clone Wars, also voiced by Jon Favreau. The resurrection of our warrior past is about to begin. The Mandalorian, whose name is Din Djarin, um, is your iconically cool, flawed, mysterious, lone, you know, loner, Gunslinger. This episode, we finally have a face and name reveal for our Mandalorian hero, and we now know that his name is in fact Din Djarin. The episode also explains that he has not gone by his birth name ever since he swore the creed of Mandalore, further confirming that a foundling forsakes his former identity until his signet and clan is revealed. Even though his name is revealed against his will by Moff Gideon, once his signet is chosen, the armorer willingly calls him by his birth name Din Djarin. This detail is there to show us that he is now officially recognized by that name among the Mandalorian clans. Even though his name was leaked long before the series aired, and we already knew what Pedro Pascal looked like under the helmet, these were still incredibly powerful moments and served to show us the vulnerability and humanity of a Mandalorian warrior. And and yet, um, the idea is that, you know, he's, he's, he's relatable. We're all kind of covered in our own armor, you know, and terrified of taking that armor off. Agent Callus is an ISB agent, an Imperial Security Bureau. So it's a little bit like the FBI, a little bit like military police. When Moff Gideon has the crew trapped in the safe house, it is the Mandalorian Din Djarin who identifies the villain as Moff Gideon, a former member of the ISB. The ISB, or Imperial Security Bureau, was a faction within the Empire dedicated to internal security and spy work. The ISB has only a handful of notable characters within the Star Wars universe, including Agent Callus from Star Wars Rebels, an ISB agent who served as a villain of the early parts of the series and then later defected to the Rebel cause under the codename Fulcrum. Another member of the ISB was Colonel Wolf Ularen, a former Admiral of the Republic during the Clone Wars. Wolf Ularen joined the ISB after the rise of the Empire and can be seen aboard the Death Star wearing a white uniform in Star Wars A New Hope. Now Lord Vader will provide us with the location of the Rebel Fortress by the time this station is operational. Obi-Wan never told you what happened to your father. When Din Djarin tells his crew to find the Mandalorian Covert, he tells Cara Dune to identify the child as a foundling, confirming the hopes of many that the Mandalorians would take on the child and raise him in the Mandalorian way. As it turns out, however, not all foundlings become Mandalorians. We learn from the Armorer that foundlings are adopted into the clans either until their birth family is located or until they come of age and swear themselves to the Mandalorian creed. As such, Din Djarin is officially recognized as the father of the child by Mandalorian right. No, I am your father. Governor? 
For generations, my ancestors fought proudly as warriors against the Jedi. When the armorer tells stories of the Mandalorian's encounters with Force sensitives, she references a battle between the Jedi and Mandalore the Great. While the title of Mandalore the Great is not a name we've heard either in canon or in legends, it is reminiscent of the title Mandalore the Ultimate, the Mandalore famous for his war with the Jedi Revan. Even though this title is not a reference to a specific Mandalore we've seen in the past, it does harken back to the legend's idea that Mandalorian leaders forsake their old name and known simply by the name Mandalore, followed by a title such as Great, First, Ultimate, or Preserver. There weren't many of us after that last battle. Mandalore himself was killed at the hands of the Jedi Revan. I have chosen to test this station's destructive power on your home planet of Alderaan. If you look closely at Cara Dune's face, you may have noticed a small black speck underneath her left eye. If you look closely, however, eagle-eyed fans may have already noticed that this speck is in fact a tattoo bearing the symbol of the Rebellion and the New Republic. This is yet another mark on Cara Dune to demonstrate her former loyalties to the New Republic. We also learn from Moff Gideon that Cara Dune hails from the planet of Alderaan, the first planet to be totally destroyed by the Death Star's full capabilities. Having clearly survived the destruction of her homeworld, it's likely that this detail is a little bit of insight to the event that led Cara Dune to fight so strongly against the Empire. We can infer that her hatred of the Empire outweighs her loyalty to the New Republic, and it was likely her hatred that caused her to fight rather than any belief in the New Republic or the Rebellion's cause. We know this because when the Mandalorian tries to recruit Cara Dune to help him protect the child, it isn't until she learns that the Mandalorian's targets are Imperials that she agrees to join. Continue with the operation. You may fire when ready. What? <laughs> R3, access the computer and find the inventory manifest. When the team finds the lava raft, it is ferried by an odd bipedal variation of an R2 unit. The design is certainly not one we're familiar with in Star Wars, and his boops and chirps are distinctly different from that of a standard R2 unit. However, that does not mean that this is the first time we have heard this specific tone of chirps from an R-series droid. The sounds made by the fairy droid are in fact the same exact sounds emitted from R3-S6, the gold R3 unit who temporarily replaces R2-D2 in the first series of Star Wars The Clone Wars. R3-S6 turned out to be a sabotage droid working for the Separatists, and attempted to eliminate Anakin and Ahsoka by activating a group of IG-86 assassin droids. This little detail is a bit of inconsequential foreshadowing at the total uselessness of the fairy droid in this episode. The fairy droid who continues rowing to lead the team into their deaths even when he has been instructed to stop. The difference, however, is that in this episode, it is in fact the IG unit itself who proves to be the ultimate rescue of our heroes. That sounded like R2. How can you tell the difference? When considering the terms of surrender, Cara Dune emphasizes that she is unable to surrender for fear of being uploaded to a mind flayer. Since this term is totally new to Star Wars, we can only speculate at what this is. The term uploaded implies that this may be some sort of mechanical torture device, like the one we saw Han Solo subjected to in The Empire Strikes Back, and similar to the ones that the Inquisitors were conditioned with in Jedi Fallen Order. However, the phrase Mind Flayer has appeared in other fantasy settings, including Dungeons and & Dragons, and usually refers to a species rather than a device. If that's the case, then it's also possible that this is a more descriptive term for the enigmatic Borgullet, seen in Star Wars Rogue One. Borgullet will know the truth. So you recognize it? That I do. It is the Darksaber, a symbol for the leader of House Vizsla, 
If you're a fan of Star Wars The Clone Wars or Star Wars Rebels, then there's absolutely no way you missed the significance of the episode's final shot. However, for those unfamiliar with Star Wars animated series, they may not know the significance of the strange weapon held by Moff Gideon in the episode's end. A strange glowing blade with black darkness at its center, Moff Gideon holds what appears to be a lightsaber, but unlike any lightsaber we've ever seen previously in live-action Star Wars. This is the Darksaber a lightsaber crafted by the first Mandalorian Jedi, Tar Vizsla. Last we saw the Darksaber, it was handed off by Sabine Wren to Bo-Katan Kryze in order to unite the Mandalorian clans. This saber is an important symbol to that house and respected by the other clans. Yeah, so John said, do you want to be this droid? And I went, yeah. I don't really question things like that. This was the first episode directed by Taika Waititi, famous for directing Thor Ragnarok and his portrayal of Korg in the MCU. Yeah, now I just do the smaller fights, warm up the crowd and whatnot. Throughout this series, he has provided the voice of former assassin and now nurse droid IG-11, and the season finale marks the first and only episode he directed in season one. The episode dealt heavily with the concepts of priorities and sacrifice. Early in the episode, the Mandalorian is willing to sacrifice his life to stay true to the Mandalorian Creed. Later in the episode, the IG unit sacrifices his life to save the child and to upload his new primary programming. Finally, the Mandalorian foregoes a life of wealth and bounty hunting to take on the responsibilities of a father and to bring the child to his home. This is the way. With the season one over, we can now take some time to really reflect on everything that happened in the series. It won't be until next year until we get season two, but I'm thankful that season one was as great as it was. Now that the season is over, we can take some time to dive deeper into The Mandalorian and really expand on all that this amazing series has to offer and begin to prepare for season two. Mandalorian, look outside. They are waiting for you. 